Okay, <clears throat> brief, uh, very brief history, personal history. Uh, family farm in western New York State, too hot in the summer, too much work, too dusty, and my mother thought I was a mathematician anyway. So um, six years in uh, one-room country school, uh, regular size high school, Cornell with uh, engineering physics, electron microscopes, uh, embryology and histology and you know related things like that. Uh, MIT with a bunch of people trying to translate human languages and that was a, a bit difficult. Oops, I've done something here. Um, and finally, not finally, but uh, at long last, uh, I arrived at Bell Labs in the Computer Techniques Research Department in 1962 and people were starting to make pictures of one sort or another, uh, mostly with scientific and technical interest uh, topics, but uh, even Mike Knoll in 62 or 3 was doing things he called computer art. Um, he made a Mondrian-type picture and uh, showed it to people and asked them, uh, and also the Mondrian that inspired it, asked them two questions, uh, which do you like better and which uh, one do you think was made by a computer? And uh, to his delight, uh, they liked his better, and they thought uh, his was made by the artist, and Mondrian's being more regular was made by a computer, obviously. So he won on both counts with the two, probably, two questionably right or wrong answers. Um, as soon as I, almost as soon as I got there, I looked, uh, looked at this uh, possibility of making pictures of machines, and I wrote a three-page memo to my department head and said, uh, hey, uh, how about a language for making movies by computer, animated movies by computer? And I, I kind of spelled it out a little bit, and uh, he had a two-sentence answer to that, which kind of launched my career, and off, off I went. He said, uh, it looks awfully ambitious, um, but why don't you see what you can do? And so I was off and running. Um, why don't you see what you can do? That was very much the spirit of Bell Labs in the 60s and 70s. I mean, that was a really incredible time. And people playing with things that they were interested in really did do amazing and discover amazing things. Uh, the evidence of the Big Bang and radio astronomy and the transistor and the first, you know, the idea of the first, uh, trans, uh, first uh, communication satellite and oh, just so many, many things. Uh, anyway, in 63, I developed, in fact, the first, as far as I know, the first raster, <clears throat> the first language, and, and implemented the first computer language for raster movies, uh, which we called B-Flex. It was incredibly simple, and, and uh, I, I, at one point later, wanted to find all of the copies of it and destroy them, because it was so ridiculously simplistic. And, and in today's terms. Uh, I do remember one thing from those early years. A couple of years later, there was a, a big show and tell where five of us, uh, four or five of us, got to, uh, got to stand up on our hind legs and, and tell a whole bunch of uh, reporters uh, about the things, the wonderful things that we were doing with computers. And one of them uh, sort of badgered me afterward. He said, well, we will, we will make, um, posthumous movies of Doris Day and Roth Hudson. And, and I said uh, two things, one of which was perhaps credible and good and appro appropriate, and one of which was totally and baselessly wrong. I mean, in, in retrospect, I said, nothing like that will ever be done. Because uh, think of all of the complexity of defining, in, in human terms, defining the articulation of form and shape and articulation of the bones and the flesh on the bones and the skin on the flesh and the hair on the skin blowing in the wind. Think how much effort would be involved in defining all of these things. Well, as you know, uh, topic, uh, movies like this have been made. Movies with, with objects and people and, and figures have been in fact made with hair blowing in the wind and, and all of that stuff. Uh, so I was, I guessed, way off base, but I, I must tell you, <clears throat> I am one of the people who stands up at the end of a feature-length animated film 
and watches the credits roll. And then I'm just flabbergasted. I'm, I'm astounded at the number of lines that go by. And they are not all names of people. They are names of, of libraries and departments and projects and, and, and studios. And, and my gosh, think of all of the time, all of the numbers of human years of work that have gone into one of those things. It's, it's just, it makes me wonder, isn't there some better way to tell a story? Because <laughs> the story is the thing, darn it. I mean, I, I, I admire what's been done, but my gosh, if, if you're just trying to tell a story, then tell the story and, and instead of flashing all of your fancy stuff. Um, so that's, that's a matter to discuss, perhaps. But anyway, I, I'm... Uh, I was wrong about whether that would be done. It, it has been done. In my first, let's see, what, uh, my first experience with art, which was a kind of a funny thing to me because I did not think of myself as an artist, <clears throat> my first uh, run into this huge edifice uh, it kind of stunned me. I actually walked around this big building called Art and, and I found a weak spot on the side and kind of broke in. And then the way that happened was um, Leon Harmon and I got together once and, and the result of that was that when Ed David, a couple levels up, came home, came back to the work from a, after a trip, one whole wall of his building, of, of his office rather, was covered with uh, what we thought was a sort of graffiti. It was little symbols of uh, electronic uh, gadgets, you know, resistors and transistors and so forth. If you got back far enough, it was a picture of a nude. But we thought that, that nobody uh, looking at a picture that's 12 feet wide would see that from 12 feet or 15 feet away. Well, it turned out that there were more people uh, who, who were familiar with the subject matter more, more than we expected, and they, they saw it. And the funny thing, you know, uh, funny things happened with it then. First of all, <clears throat> Ed thought, Ed David, uh, thought this was not very good for his office at Bell Labs. Um, um, we all helped him uh, take it back to his family rec room that night. <clears throat> the PR department called us in and said, you may, we were a little bit worried, what do they want with us now? Um, you may distribute this if you want to, but do not associate the name Bell Laboratories with it. Whew, okay, well, we, we agreed. But about a year later, this thing did appear in Robert Rauschenberg's loft at a press conference and the next day it appeared on the first page of the second section above the fold of the New York Times with the names Harmon, Knowlton, and Bell Labs all together in a bundle. <laughs> <clears throat> and the PR department had something else to say that does not surprise us. What they did say did surprise us. Uh, they, they apparently had an epiphany. It was not, it was not graffiti. It was not pornography, as they at first assumed, but it had appeared in the venerable New York Times. It was art. And they said to us, you may go, you may continue to distribute it, but when you do, please be sure that people know that it was done at Bell Telephone Laboratories Incorporated. <laughs> so, wow. <clears throat> and after that, then, uh, several, uh, a few, not, not, not very many, half a dozen collaborations with artists, uh, uh, Stan Vanderbeek, Lillian Schwartz, and, and a few others. And, uh, and I have a, that was, uh, th there were good and bad things to say about that. And I, I suggest you look at my website, my uh, uh, KenNolton.com website. Uh, where there's a paper called Frust On Frustrations of Collaborating with Artists. And the, the frustrations go two ways in general, just to put it, to, to tie it up in a neat little bundle, but there's lots of, lots of other stuff. The artist has a preconception of what the computers do and, and what the computer people do and come in with, with ideas, and some of them are to, to just way beyond the possibilities. The, the most uh, 
extreme example was Stan Vanderbeek, who would come in half a day a week, and he would want, he would say, let's, let's digitize, let's scan a film and then do such and such with it. And if we only had 10 times as much time, 10 times as much computer power, 10 times as fast, you know, for scanning, it took us 15 minutes sometimes to, to scan one picture on a revolving drum or something like that. He, and then let's do this and let's do that, and then I said, wait a minute, this, is, this isn't what we've got. Um, and, and so forth, well anyway. And uh, what happened about Leon and me, um, he became an artist, but I didn't at first. And that happened in the following way. There was a, lots of excitement about computer people and technology, you know, computer and technology folk collaborating with artists and producing art and technology collaborations. And we wanted to show this thing in an art and technology collaboration. So one of us had to be an artist. And we flipped a coin and he became the artist. And I, I stayed at, is there a better word for geek? I mean, something a little more respectable. Than, anyway, I was the techno geek for a while. And uh, it took me on about 15 more years to say, what the heck? I mean, to be an artist, you have to say you're an artist. And then, what, then, and then so. So that's the, that was the beginning. And then I'll show you is rather quickly a, a bunch of things that I have done lately. This is since 1980. Um, using things that I've learned uh, along the way about taking pictures apart and putting them back together. I often see things like, uh, for example, a whole mound of seashells along the floor, along the, the shore of uh, Vieques Island and picked up three coffee cans full and carried them around for a while. And then finally I talked about it and I was commissioned to do a, something that I thought could be done, uh, which is a picture of Jacques Cousteau made of the seashells that I had been <coughs> lugging around for, th for six years. Each of these, and slides hereafter, will be the same, very same picture at different sizes because a lot of the fun of mosaics is seeing something different up close from what you see far away. So this is Jacques Cousteau in seashells, obviously a connection between the, the material and the person. Sometimes uh, there is not a connection. I decided that seashells, for one thing, were a medium in their own right, and they could be used for uh, anybody's picture. Um, the very latest one, then, is... Um, Mona Lisa. There is a connection here with, with seashells, actually. One of the th puzzles of Leonardo was, why are there seashells on mountaintops? So there's, uh, there's something about seashells. Samuel Morse, in Morse code symbols, each, each contiguous little group of things is one of the letters of Morse code. <coughs> Helen Keller in... Uh, in uh, 30 in uh, 16, 16 examples each of each of the 64 braille letters. This, this is, for those of you who don't realize, this is not a sick joke. This is um, visual braille is used by teachers of the blind in uh, making problems and grade grading homework. Einstein in Dice, because of his uh, famous, you know, here's Dice in your face, Einstein, uh, who said, I do not, I will never believe that God plays Dice with the world. <clears throat> and carrying on the Dice um, uh, sort of tribute to the um, evolution, uh, the, the, the theory of evolution with, uh, again with Dice, this time five, five colors of Dice that I could find cheaply at the dollar stores, and with the, the idea, of course, of uh, DNA being shaken uh, over the centuries and, and millennia and, and eons. This is my poke at Magritte. This is not, not a teapot, because it's not only a picture of a teapot, but it is a teapot in sort of sad shape, but it's one complete teapot that uh, contributed its parts to making the picture. <coughs> Emma Lazarus and her poem, you know, that has the famous, give me your tired, your poor, and so forth, a, a thing that's getting a little bit uh, out of date or turned upside down these days. 
I run into things like picture puzzle. This is, this is not exactly a tribute to Thomas Kincaid, uh, but I, I ran across a picture, his painting on the, on the lower left, and uh, it had been given to a puzzle company who chopped it up into a pump picture jigsaw puzzle. <coughs> and I said to myself, well, can I recre recover the artist from one of his paintings by just rearranging the pieces? Now, if I rearrange the pieces, they won't fit back together, but uh, they will still look like something. And rearranging them, this is what I, what I produce using the picture on the lower left as the target, that's the, that's Kincaid. <clears throat> this is Ray of Tom and Ray in Car Talk, NPR, made of 300 cars, 300 toy cars. And there's the two of them. I will never do that again, these cars are to all wired on there, they are two and a half times as long as they are wide, so the tiling problem is a real, it doesn't give you much, much freedom. <clears throat> this is spools of thread um, for Aaron Feuerstein. He's the fellow you may know the story. He was the owner and, uh, and president of Malden Mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts. It had a great fire there that burned down half of the mill. And instead of collecting the insurance money and buying an island, he kept all the workers on salary while the mill was being rebuilt. And for that, they, they, they just uh, love him so up there, and, uh, and I do too. I mean, I think that's just a marvelous example, of, of, unfortunately a singular example, uh, I guess, of decency, a real decency in business. I sent this to him, uh, I sent it to his executive assistant saying uh, if he, I wanted to see it from a distance at first and, and uh, if he kind of turns up his nose at it, uh, we'll talk about what to do about it. But it's my present to him otherwise if he likes it. He called me, he loved it, he called me and thanked me for it. We had a, uh, then and, and even sometime later, we've had a couple wonderful conversations on the phone of across uh, admiration. <laughs> This is one of my grandchildren who loves M&Ms. This is Stephanie. And uh, it's done in <clears throat> with a hexagonal tessellation, which is sadly neglected. I mean, these, these uh, hexagonal areas fit together so much better than squares do. And I, people should have used these as pixels as readily as the squares. <clears throat> this, for no reason, and it's in triangles. I was simply asked to make a picture for the blurb of, um, for the, the, the program at one of the EG meetings. This is Richard Saul Werman, who's the founder of the TED and EG conferences. So I made uh, this, uh, this picture for him. And can I have another eight slides time? Sure. Okay. Um, mathematicians. Mathematicians are wonderful sources of ideas for pictures. This is Martin Gardner, who for, throughout the 60s and 70s, wrote the Mathematical Games column of Scientific American, and he's written many, many books about scientific puzzles, also about philosophy and so forth. Uh, and because some of the puzzles were, had to do with dominoes, I made a picture of, out of six complete sets of double nine dominoes, That's, and, and presented it to him at one of the meetings. <clears throat> Bob Wainwright solved a very difficult tiling problem with squares. 12, 12 squares, 12 by 12, 11 squares, 11 by 11, and so forth, down to one square, one by one. It's known by mathematicians that the sum of cubes uh, up to a certain point is a square. So he wanted to see if he could tile that partridge in a pear tree collection of squares, into a collection of cubes into a square, and he did. That's why I show him squares. Saul Gollum, um, a collector of puzzles about, um, about polyominoes, and he wrote a book about polyominoes. <clears throat> a polyomino is a form that's made by joining squares on their edges, and in particular, pentominoes. Lots and lots of problems about pentominoes and solutions, and uh, still outstanding problems. And uh, so this is made out of 27 of each of the 12 kinds of pentominoes. 
Um, Jerry Slocum, uh, great collector of puzzles and uh, an authority on lots of things about puzzles, including tangrams, which is one of his favorite. This is 16 black and 16 white tangrams. Will Shorts is a, <clears throat> as you know, as you probably know, the, the crossword editor of the New York Times, and uh, which presents the question, can, you, can I make something that looks sort of like a crossword puzzle and a portrait of Will Shorts? Well, yes, <clears throat> I could, sort of. Uh, the surprising thing was that one of the people who worked with him, Frank Longo, uh, actually turned this into a crossword puzzle. He has an array of, uh, of downs and crosses, and, and by golly, he filled it, except he had some problems. He wanted four more little black islands in a big white area of the forehead and chin and, and cheek. I, I, we had a talk on the phone. I said, where do you want them? And he told me, and I said, fine. So this is a joint project, the, the picture. Four of those black squares are Frank Longo's, and the rest are mine. <laughs> <clears throat> this is Douglas McKenna, who discovered a new and very interesting and elegant space-filling curve. And uh, I can tell you the details of why it's elegant, but anyway, this is based on that curve, and the picture part comes by selective uh, processing of the third iteration, for those of you who know what the infinite iteration means. <clears throat> this is um, Mark Sedatakati. He is a playing card magician. And uh, what better to make a portrait of him than symbols from playing cards? This, for no particular reason, again, is in, uh, just three of them, three self portraits. This is the triangles, uh, more or less like that uh, picture of Richard Selwerman. This is. Simply a spread of white dots on black background uh, so as to look something like me, and then bridges between the adjacent white dots, adjacent vertically, horizontally, or diagonally, and I don't know a better way to say it, uh, than the, the lonely ones that are left behind. Uh, I, I, what do I do with them? Because they don't look right, those little spots. I, I exterminate the orphans. And lastly, a, a very tightly cropped self-portrait. Um, 284 seashells. Okay, that's my story. Lillian Schwartz lives in a modern home deep in the woods in Wachung that also serves her as studio and gallery. There you can see the evolution of this artist from her early sculpture through electronic sculpture and her first computer graphics. You work in lots of different media. Why? Why? Uh, I guess as, uh, for myself as an artist, I, I'm more of an experimenter and an innovator. I like to um, use tools and find out what th that particular tool can do. When I feel I've exhausted that direction, for me, I go on to another medium. I find that working in the technology that is around us, that affects us every day, uh, is much more exciting to me to deal with, to try to harness that technology. And, and what is the reaction of the art world? It's a mixed reaction in the sense that, uh, first of all, with computers, the first time I entered a computer graphic into an exhibition, it was turned down because it was made by a computer. But the next time I entered the same piece and called it a silk screen, uh, it was accepted and won an award. Uh, so that, that that's past now. In fact, Mrs. Schwartz is acknowledged as the pioneer in her field. Her work is exhibited in the Museum of Modern Art, the Smithsonian Institute, and major museums throughout the world. She is currently working on a documentary for the 1981 Venice Biennale and teaches at Rutgers University. Her 1968 Proxima Centauri anticipated the first moon landing. And this scale model will eventually have different reflective backings. Do you mean it to be fun? Oh, yes, yes, yes. A lot of your work is fun. Right, I think that's important. I feel my contribution as an artist is to take you away from daily vicissitudes of life. From computer graphics, Mrs. Schwartz moved into animation and filmmaking. 
Perhaps her most famous work is Pictures from a Gallery, based on 100 photographs of her family. This is a computer-generated film using a, a tremendous number of snapshots of my family. Each picture was scanned by a computer. The information was stored. And then through programming, the picture could be abstracted either in a divisionistic manner or in a pointillistic manner. And we'll get to one of the pointillism, for instance, that one, which went by very fast, which I've, I've nicknamed technological pointillism. It is not dehumanizing. I mean, people have a very strange uh, reaction to using a computer, and even art students who have not had access feel that one is prostituting oneself by using a machine. But you soon realize it's a big, black, dumb box, and that you have to feed into it information so that it does come back. Although I have to change that a bit because there is a chance, there is a probability that you can get a mistake, or like a runny technique when you're painting, um, so that it offers just as much freedom and flexibility and much more than a lot of other media I worked in. One of the mistakes Mrs. Schwartz left in, the prize-winning Olympiad, in which some of the runners accidentally metamorphosed into monsters. Most of the music for Mrs. Schwartz's films are also computer-generated. Now she's switching from film to videotape. Do you know what's going to intrigue you next? Um, Whatever our technology presents us with, I'm sure I'll try. I've used lasers and uh, microphotography. And whatever is around in today's world is, is what I hope to use and harness as a medium to give me some kind of a new image. One intriguing project she's working on, using the computer to recreate the ancient harbor of Carthage destroyed in 146 BC. She's also working with a physicist on this magnetized sculpture which seeks to defy gravity. Okay, now, you see this little thing here, this little... Yeah. And always she's learning, studying, probing. Wherever technology goes, Lillian Schwartz is prepared to follow. I'm Wendy Sherman, reporting.
My first exposure to computer art was at the Machine Exhibition, the Museum of Modern Art. I had a piece of sculpture in the same exhibition called Proxima Centauri. And this is where I met Ken, who later instructed me in using the computer for still graphics. In using uh, snapshots of my family, I was able to animate the pictures, sometimes making them more abstract and not recognizable, and then by using proper programs, bringing them back into reality and giving you a recognizable image. was closed for four months. It was being rebuilt for the last four years. What are we talking about? The newly expanded Museum of Modern Art, with twice as much gallery space to exhibit the greatest collection of modern art in the world, and a new glass and steel garden hall with escalators that take you to six floors of special exhibition galleries. The newly expanded Museum of Modern Art. It's now open, 11 West 53rd Street. Arguably, the most famous painting in the world is one that hangs in the Louvre in Paris, the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. For nearly five centuries, the lady with the mystic smile has been an enigma. Who was she? Art historians have guessed, but no one really knew. Now, computers can analyze a painting digitally. And an expert in computer graphic arts, Lillian Schwartz, working at Bell Laboratories, compared the famous painting with a self-portrait the artist did when he was 64 and made a startling discovery. And the pupils lined up exactly. And at that point, I felt there's something going on here. There's a match. It's a match. The conclusion underneath, after seeing it, even before it got here, I said, my god, Leonardo painted himself. He was his own model. That was it. The idea that the Mona Lisa was a man, and none other than Leonardo himself, is a stunning revelation to some in the art world. Art and Antiques magazine ripped its forthcoming issue off the presses to make this a cover story.
Yeah. Well, I'll just show you a few pictures of work most most people know me by. This is a piece in a sculpture in, in Baltimore, uh, and this is one actually that is on in this show that is at Marlboro right away um, at this moment. Um, this, this is really the center of this interest. This is, um, I became fascinated long, long ago with the question that is still a mystery to everybody. What would an atom look like if we were magically able to see it? Um, uh, science has many pictures um, depending on um, certain equations that give spatial form to it, but it does not, they don't even try to describe the activities of the architecture of the electrons. So this, this was just a very primitive idea from 1948 uh, before I really became quite involved in this idea. Um, here's how it really happened. <clears throat> I was um, learning about, <clears throat> you know what, I need some water, is that possible? Thank you. Dad. Thank you very much. Um, on the top there um, are four structures that um, undergo a transformation. If you see they from left to right, uh, you could imagine if you do a time lapse of the in-between stages, you would see those, the tubes in this rotating, actually spinning like propellers. Um, it was, it, that, that I became interested because of these phenomena uh, with these structures that they have uh, rotation or implied rotation. So what I began to do is to describe these rotational systems with actual circles. Um, it became quite an enterprise. Uh, they, um, they resemble polyhedra uh, and yet they're not really exact replicas of the equivalent polyhedra where the circles are transformed into polygons. Um, but there are many, many systems possible. These, I did find this uh, considerable store of uh, circle uh, rings in, on Canal Street at that time. And I began to drill holes and uh, connect these together in these, all of these various config geometrical configurations. Um, then, I found something very interesting. There were certain sets of these that can uh, alternate in a binary sense. Uh, the, the upper left are magnets, which can associate, cling together by their edges. And um, th these are other uh, binary uh, figures here that um, were, became very useful because I found um, there were seven sets of uh, circle hedras, I began to call them circle spheres, um, that, uh, that could do this uh, remarkable magnetic feat, uh, cling together in a mosaic surrounding a sphere. The binary properties of these spherical forms are interesting because uh, binariness is expressed in north and south pole magnets in color alterations or in rotation. Right, they're all binary binary principles, and they they all can be expressed in in these um, circle um, circle forms, um, and they can even more. Interestingly, they can translate into space and still uh, maintain their uh, circular, uh, their, their magnetic um, uh, continuity. So that these, um, the rotational uh, properties that you saw on the previous form could actually, theoretically, if you had a friction-free space, you could rotate one wheel and everything would rotate from here to the moon. Now, 
<clears throat> this, this got me interested in uh, the question of what do atoms look like. Uh, these, these are different people's conceptions. You can scan, you can Google image an atom on the web and find many, many different ideas that people have. Essentially, uh, we're stuck with an analogy that was left from the early days, which uh, is the um, planetary analogy that was left over from Niels Bohr. <clears throat> um, and despite the uh, sophisticated um, directions that science has taken us, the, the model still fundamentally is grounded in a planetary analogy. Uh, so um, what I deduced from all of this is that what's needed is a new analogy. Um, so I had the basis for uh, a speculative new analogy, which is circle spheres with magnets uh, as, as part of their properties. Um, I tried, this, is, this is getting to computers, believe it or not. Um, I, I tried over the years, so this, this started, by the way, in 1960, and um, I tried for many years to, to, to make out of materials things that, are, that look like this imagined figure that I had in mind, but nothing really did, I think, did things in steel and so forth. Um, I always imagined there might be some way to visualize these ideas uh, more satisfactorily than with materials, with joints and welds and so forth. Um, so here it was. I want you to look at the price. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, I did not have the Bell Labs. Um, I told my daughter, forget about going to college. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I ran across these figures today because uh, John Monahan, who works with me, he's in the audience, was working uh, computers and I was looking through my files and I found the actual prices for what I had purchased in that time. Uh, Wavefront software was about $45,000 and the SGI computer with a big, big 40% discount was $46,000. This had, as I show up there, 16 megahertz and eight, eight megabytes of memory <clears throat> uh, for all that money. At any rate, I, I began to make um, pictures with this machine. I, I had not, I didn't have really the proper training in computer school or something. I really learned this um, by working really literally 14 hours a day. In the first place, every one of these renderings took so much time on that com machine that it was a great devotion of time. And, and uh, since I tend to be an obsessive type anyway, as you can know by the uh, plastic rings. <laughs> uh, I, I was willing to spend that time on it. Um, this was a, a representation of the rotation and counter-rotation of these adjacent magnets on, on this form. Um, and so many, many things became possible that weren't possible at all before. And even, now we're talking, I started this in 1987, so we're talking 22 years ago. Uh, John, who works with me, is 21, 20. So uh, he was born two years after I started this, and he's 10 times better at this than I ever was. <laughs> um, some of these ideas I tried to do graphically. One of, one of the fundamental aspects of this model is that the electron has a circular orbit, which is a standing wave. This is a, goes back in history to Louis de Broglie. However, what never has been anticipated is that these standing waves actually act like material objects, that they keep one another out of the space they occupy. And to me, it's the only way that a, a sound uh, atomic architecture can be described, explained. Um, <clears throat> anyway, a lot of these things were very time consuming and and represent a different, I can't go into all the arguments about in, in this model, but here was my primitive animation at the time. <clears throat> this represents a single electron and a hydrogen atom moving from energy level to energy level while it expels and 
and uh, absorbs energy. I made other pictures. This is a uh, picture that uh, did win a prize at Ars Electronica in 1989. Uh, it, was, um, it, it is based on an actual sculpture of mine called Forest Devil. And um, the actual fact, I was, I was invited to be on a panel that was to take place in a month or two about the use of computers as for sculptors. And I knew how very much time it took to make these pictures and to render them. And so this took three and a half days with that computer to render it with ray tracing and so forth. Um, so I was going to be the sourpuss, I knew, because I knew that I could build a model much faster than I could make it on a computer. So I, I did this picture over a long period of time. And I really don't know now what the algorithms are which one could depend on, but at the time what I had to do was to implant about each one of the tips of each one of those tubes, a group of polygons, and then tell the one polygon to connect with the other polygon. So it'd be, um, I've forgotten even what the um, expression was, but it was something like uh, connect 1267 with uh, 1488 or something like that. And it's very hard, to, so I mean, this was days of work. I think it would be easier now. This, this now moves into another current technology. This is a um, stereolithography representation of the atom of my imagination. And um, this never could have been done in any other medium before, no matter how skilled, I, th I mean, even the Chinese ivory carvers that made those marvelous Chinese balls would have a difficult time with this one. Um, <clears throat> the company Autodesk um, invited four of us, four sculptors, to make um, sculptures on a computer and then print them out in um, rapid prototype. And these, these are two of my pieces and they obviously are related to this atom model. Um, they went to China and they're being, they were carved in, in granite. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so they, there were, there are four of us. I said each, each of us did five, were allowed five pieces each. And um, this is the way they were done. This is a marvelous to me uh, expansion, extension of technology that um, techno technique, these are, these are stone carving people as a tradition in these places, in these towns. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, there are from, I was telling people this evening, there are 100 to 300 carvers working in this place at any one time. And um, so they did these rather marvelously. Um, I don't know if, I suppose that somebody could have made a maquette just like these in clay in times past and actually had them. I mean, it wouldn't have been too difficult, but it was, wouldn't have been uh, such a rewarding process as to blow them up into these uh, large pieces. These are three of the pieces. Uh, they were four, four feet in diameter, and each one of them weighs about uh, 6,000 pounds. And the base weighs a thousand pounds. I, I own them now. <laughs> um, anyway, this is these were taken by three of the artists who uh, went to China. Uh, I didn't attend the opening, but it's kind of wonderful that this is an international thing. These are these uh, pieces were shown in four different museums in China, and this was the opening. Uh, these are the guys, uh, on the left is Carl Bass, the tall guy in the back, he's the CEO of Autodesk, and uh, these other artists, Bruce Beasley, uh, John Isherwood, and uh, Robert Smith, uh, all participated in this. Uh, this is John Monaghan, <laughs> who, who, without whom I wouldn't have been able to do any of these things. Uh, he's wonderful. At any rate, he went to China. Actually, we sent him to China. Uh, I love this photograph. 
Uh, this is really international. Here's a wedding couple dressed apparently in a, I don't know, flamenco costume or whatever. Uh, anyway, to having their picture taken next to a sphere which uh, re reflects on the ancient Chinese ivory ball uh, done by an American artist with a computer uh, translated with rapid prototype and carved <laughs> by Chinese carvers. Uh, anyway, th this is the last thing. I just wanted to, I am involved in many technologies because I like tools, I like gadgets, I, I work with them. This is a, a GigaPen, uh, which is a uh, new computerized device, a, a little robotic device that was developed by NASA. And uh, they're available on the web, gigapen.org, if you haven't seen it. It's really quite incredible. Uh, these these um, cameras on the camera mount uh, snap pictures in columns and then move over to a second column. And they, they, um, they provide you with a mosaic of, say, 150 or more individual photographs that get stitched together. And... Um, what you have an enormous file. And so you can go on the gigapen.org uh, uh, site and you can zoom in on the presidential, the, the, not the inauguration, and see a quarter of a mile away somebody has a polka dot necktie uh, because there's an amazing amount of information on it. But I, here, here's, uh, this, this can't show you the details, but I did this in uh, beneath the, I felt tower in October. My real reason for bringing up Guggenheim, is, I mean, the, the, the uh, Gigapan, is to show you that my show is going to be on until March the uh, 21st. Okay. <clears throat>
computer. I started writing actually on the computer before I started making images because there wasn't, uh, there was so little memory there to, to actually create images. It was very compelling. So um, what happened was that I was in this period that was very different from the abstract, uh, rather um, conceptual, not conceptual, but work that came from um, very abstract, formal kinds of work, constructivist type of work, minimalist work. And uh, when I started doing this in the early 80s, um, I had, actually things had started to change. It was possible to use photography, uh, real imagery, figurative work. And I became very interested in that. So I thought that I would show you a few of the projects that I did starting in 1986. Oh, and I wanted to mention that there were no video projectors, even though video had been discovered. Um, it was impossible. You had to use a film projector in some way. So I started using a slide projector and did a lot of work using slide projectors um, that were programmed so that I could use sound and movement with the, the uh, programming of that. So here's the first piece that I did in 1986. It was actually uh, granted by SIGGRAPH. They gave the, uh, the money for me to create this work and to, uh, I can't remember uh, where it was shown for the first time, but this work was sort of a way of me getting started with imagery, and I, I really made a comment about representation here, where, you know, we, uh, certainly Cezanne talked about images being made out of uh, um, cylinders, spheres, triangles, etc., and of course, um, perspective. So I created this small installation. It had um, three, compu uh, three computers. You can see the little holes on each side. Those images actually you can't see very well, but they're perspective images. And I projected through those little holes from one side to the other. And then there was, uh, you can't see the image on the one uh, in the background. And there was an image in that black sphere that you see. So. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of images that I was using. I was, the idea behind this was to comment on the fact that uh, we have tried to capture uh, nature and behavior, um, but uh, it's been impossible to capture it all, even with film. We know that it's, it's certainly not uh, very true, although we're getting closer and closer to it. But um, we were using math in those days, and um, um, these were, I, I was trying to show the difference between this logical kind of thinking we had with mathematical uh, views of things to something that was more um, personal, more um, un uncontrollable. <laughs> So another installation I did was based on the labyrinth. This was quite a bit later, and I created this huge um, structure, uh, and you had to enter the structure like you would go into a labyrinth. Of course, the labyrinth is a very well-known metaphor um, that covers a lot of ground in terms of, of defeating our fears, of uh, uh, creating uh, hope for the future as you went in and like Theseus going through the labyrinths to kill the Minotaur that had been uh, a fearful presence in the Minoan culture. So uh, I decided that uh, I would make it more about the idea of fears that we have about identity and you actually had to wear a mask going through the um, labyrinth to, the, to its center you had to decide whether you were going to use the female side or the male side uh, as to your outlook on what you were seeing. Here in the center of the labyrinth, um, I had a place where you could uh, watch changes uh, in the imagery 
there were five uh, different projectors here, and uh, the idea was to um, contrast them um, to see the uh, connection between the two images. That was sort of the idea of montage, which I, Einstein, Eisenstein had brought up in his filmmaking that interested me very much. I wanted to involve the audience in figuring out the connection between the images that I was creating and also to uh, question the whole idea of identity. So um, much of the time, I do a lot of research in my work. And um, so I had done a lot of research on this and made tableaus. Um, they all had different um, names to them. Let's see if I can just um, find examples of these. Sorry. <laughs> oh, one of them is unraveling the past. So you can see that it's also a montage and that the, uh, the book actually um, had folded elements in it. Mm -hmm. And so you can look underneath the little segments and contrast the meaning of these things. Another was the constructed Madonna, uh, the controlling gaze, the colonized female, the construction of, of romance was one of them, deflecting the gaze, and climbing high was the last one of those. Um, so you can see I'm skipping over a, a lot. I've, I had a lot of intermediary works, but I was trying to give you a sense of how, how I myself was beginning to change in the way I was doing things. I was using the computer as a tool a way of uh, showing these works, doing things that, um, works that, that had um, meaning to me and, uh, and yet uh, I could not do them in any other way um, other than the books at that time. So here is a, um, a work uh, called Black Box. Remember that the black box when there's a, an air crash they always look for the black box to find the truth of things. Why did the plane crash? So I decided to call this science fiction piece um, the, the black box. It actually turned out to be red. <laughs> it's on the left. I went down to Washington and um, I was allowed to look at the black boxes and uh, they lent me one for this exhibition. And on the table there for the first time I was asking people to participate. Uh, each of the, of the books had a question about the future. So this piece had to do a lot with the environment, global warming, even in those days I was concerned about it. And um, so the interior of the um, black box was very large. You had to go through, um, through a corridor where you saw biological uh, transformations taking place in these large test tubes. And when you got into the middle of it, there were all these hanging, let's see if I can come to the, that looks more like the middle of it. You can see there were hanging scrims with, uh, there were 13 projectors here and sound. Uh, and another projector that was swirling around the room and uh, which showed um, a lot of statistics about the time period. Uh, one of the questions about the, that brought on the science fiction piece had to do with human reproduction, that it was becoming dangerous. I mean, let's talk about this taking place in uh, like 19, I mean, sorry, 2050. So I was using that as a way of, of really um, bringing up questions that I felt people should be uh, interested in and concerned about. And I think it's still... Uh, an important uh, piece because of that. Um, so you can see in the distance the, the uh, actually it was the first time I also used video. You could look out through those eye shapes at the back and see that you're coming in for a landing. Um, so after that you can tell that I'm very interested in bringing up questions of political issues 
And um, when I got to uh, uh, this work, it had to do with AIDS and the question of um, healing and um, about wounds that we have. It was made um, around, we were getting close to the end of the century and I was very concerned about um, the losses that we feel and the healing that needs to take place in the, in the world in general. Unfortunately, these are very poor uh, slides, but um, what I did was to use a poem that was um, projected in white letters through a steam. There's steam in the front. You can't really take a picture of this, but you have to imagine that there was um, vapor, that the words were uh, programmed to uh, pass through this to give a kind of effect that um, was quite an emotional statement. So these images all have to do with issues around that subject matter. And amnesia, of course, you know that amnesia refers to a, a loss of memory. And anamnesia means bringing back memory. In other words, healing the wounds that you've, you've been suffering through, whether it's it's a psychological one or a human one. We all have wounds of some kind. And so this piece was um, definitely having to do with, with those issues and with um, issues of, um, certainly with AIDS particularly, because AIDS in those days, that was the early 90s. I remember going to uh, meetings of ACT UP and being concerned about that whole thing. So I also did a book called The Book of Plagues, um, which also uh, explored uh, these kinds of issues of plagues from the uh, black plagues in, the mid in uh, medieval times up to the present. So um, let's see, we're up now to uh, 1995. And uh, I had become very involved with um, domestic violence. And uh, there was a large meeting, a uh, women's meeting in uh, Beijing at the time, uh, United Nations meeting. And I decided that the piece that I had produced about uh, domestic violence would be best as an internet work. So it was really the time where you could first make the, it was possible to actually ordinary people, <laughs> artists who were interested, could get help in figuring out how to do HTML. And uh, so this is the first um, internet piece that I did. And on it, I was able to put statistics. I was able to create images. And uh, with this piece also was the first time that I tried to get um, writings and uh, maps uh, and poetry from people around the country. So this is just the parts of the internet, the first one that I did. It was very simple, um, but I was really pleased that this could be online and that people could go there and leave their stories about what happened to them. So it was my first effort at that. Um, the next piece that I did was uh, an internet project called Turns, uh, yourturningpoint.com. It's still there. You can go to it, um, and I was invited at the time to go to Taiwan um, to show this piece, so um, I created an installation there because people could not read my website. I created one which um, allowed people to um, go to the side of the place where uh, the installation was, and fill out forms with their stories. I was astonished at the response of the Chinese uh, there. Uh, I had, they shipped to me back to New York four boxes full of stories in Chinese from people who had responded to this idea of their turning point story. Of course, that meant a major turning point story. And um, the idea of this installation was that they would roll up their story and put it into the rings that uh, were in front of the uh, photographic area. And I also created an installation. Parthenia had an installation 
And I keep doing things like this where I uh, want to show the ideas that I've been working with in different forms. So here is um, the work that I did with the uh, Turns project. Uh, you notice all those little dots uh, that are uh, being projected on top of the table? Those are actually the stories that people have um, written and submitted to the site. Um, and they're projected onto the table where you can also see four different um, screens and uh, where people could actually uh, type in their stories. And they could also look at the other ones that are online. It's quite a complicated... Um, by that time, in 2002, um, by that time, you could actually do much more complex kinds of work. It was totally a different experience to be able to do that and to um, reach out much more into the public, which is something, of course, you can tell that I'm interested in doing. And uh, so now that, that the Turns Project has been out there for a long time, I felt it would be interesting to make a compilation of the best stories and drawings. So um, very quickly, um, just the, all the stories were based on either crises or epiphanies. These are the drawings that people um, or what I called as life maps, what they submitted. Um, it was quite easy. Here are some of the um, sentences from some of the, um, some of the stories, um, which uh, some of them, I think, are really moving. So you can actually buy my book on Amazon, <laughs> or you can just go to the website and explore it. Just myturningpoint.com. And um, this is um, my newest... Uh, website project, I became so involved with the idea of working on the internet because I was influenced by uh, the writings of uh, Walter Benjamin since I had been writing um, Digital Currents, um, Art in the Electronic Age. I had been studying different theorists and I really liked the words of Walter Benjamin who um, challenged uh, people who are using technology to actually use it as a medium, uh, not just a tool. I had become very involved with changing my outlook to be using the computer as a medium rather than just making things as a tool. I think that's a very important move um, that we need to think about. Um, and um, the, in the uh, internet is a way of uh, reaching out, which is what Benjamin discussed that we should try to use the latest technologies in order to get people to participate in work um, and to become part of projects so that everyone, you know, what the artist does is to create a kind of framework, uh, which I was doing, and um, uh, where other people can become part of the work, part of the artwork. So I think that's one of the major things that the computer actually brings to us that we can call out to others to participate in, in all sorts of ways. And we're in the midst now of an amazing uh, time period where we have Google, we've got Facebook, we have MySpace, we have, um, you know all the others, <laughs> uh, Flickr, et cetera. So, I mean, those are different kinds of things than what I was trying to do here in the sense of um, trying to create things that are authentic, asking people to submit their real feelings. Uh, with the Confess Project, I think of it as a kind of um, community sort of healing process, therapy, community therapy. <laughs> uh, and here, this, uh, this is a, a drawing of the installation that is going to be that I'm in the middle of um, installing at the Newberger Museum. So if you can, you'll be able to see it next weekend, not this one. Um, and what you see hanging there are small shapes that were made uh, of the confessed shapes with 3D printer uh, and speakers inside of them. You can pull them down and listen to the stories. There's just a few more pictures of that. And here's part of the website. Um, so here, when you get to the center of it, you'll hear whispered confessions, and you can bring up um, the stories of people 
um, and you can uh, explore to see other, other filtered information about age and different comments, et cetera, on the website. Mm -hmm. well, here's the place you could leave your confession, and here's one of the confess shapes. So, um, yes, I spend a lot of time drawing all these shapes and uh, uh, then digitizing them. So, uh, that's where I am right now. I've reached the point where uh, I'm thinking very much about the future, and I think we're going to be discussing that now, aren't we? Mm -hmm.